In this lecture, we're going to be having a look at diabetes. Diabetes can be conquered and it can be conquered quite easily, whether it's type 1 diabetes or type 2. Type 1 diabetes is usually if the pancreas is damaged and it is said that the cells don't make any insulin, but I have seen pancreases revive once they're given the right conditions. So, as I have mentioned several times before, page 127 of the Ministry of Healing states, in the case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained. Wrong habit, habits corrected and unhealthful conditions changed. Then nature is to be assisted in her efforts to expel impurities and re-establish right conditions back in the system. So let's have a look at some of the main causes of diabetes. Number one, Number one, believe it or not, is food. And there are some foods that cause diabetes and there are some foods that can heal diabetes. So what I'd like to begin with is looking at what is causing diabetes. And never in the history of mankind have human beings eaten so many carbohydrates. So let's do a carbohydrate assessment. In fact, they used to be called starches, but mostly they're called carbohydrates now. And for breakfast, most people are having cereal. There's a little book called Cereal Killer by Alan Watson. And this is the cereal, Cereal Killer. And he states in that book that 93% of American children have cereal for breakfast and 30% of the cereals are sugar. And by the age of three, one in three American children are obese. And I'll show you why. Also bread. Bread is a very popular food. Bread and cereal are very popular. They're just fast. They're just there. And pretzels. That's an American favorite. I'll say cakes, but I'm probably also considering uh, donuts, cookies, things like that. So I'll say etc. Pasta, very popular food. Pie, I know in Australia pies are popular. Pizza, Europeans have introduced Americans and Australians to this fast food. Also rice and uh, potatoes. And last and certainly least in nutritive value is the pure crystallized acid that's been extracted from the sugarcane plant. It's one of the most lethal substances, I believe, that has been introduced to the human frame. Now, all of these foods in the gastrointestinal tract break down to a little substance called glucose. And as I showed in my previous presentation, Glucose now can come into the blood and it goes into the blood, then it goes on the M1 main highway straight to the project manager, which is the liver. And then the liver sends the glucose to the cell. So let's have a look at what's happening in the cell. So the glucose comes into the cell and it comes in under the action of insulin. Insulin increases 30 fold the amount of glucose that can get into the cell. So let's draw a little pancreas here for our illustrations. This is the pancreas and it lives under our left rib and it releases insulin. And insulin's role in the body is to get the glucose out of the blood and into the cell. So it comes down into the cell and it goes through a 20 step pathway. That 20-step pathway delivers two units of energy and the end result of that 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. Pyruvate is the chemical form of glucose that gets fed into what's often called the powerhouse. It's called the powerhouse because even though it's only an eight-step pathway, it delivers 36 units of energy. Very impressive. And as we've looked at already in a few of our lectures, that this is an aerobic pathway because it uses oxygen. Whereas this pathway is an anaerobic pathway because it produces energy by the process of fermentation, not oxygen. 
But on a high carbohydrate diet, we have still got glucose left over. So first place is the cell. Now the second place that the liver will cause the glucose to go is to be stored in the muscle cell like a little bunch of grapes, but they're little molecules of glucose. And they're called glycogen. Glycogen is a name given to quick release glucose stores. They're just waiting there, ready to be used. Yesterday, I had breakfast like a king. Yesterday, I had lunch like a queen. Last night, I had tea like a pauper, which was a drink of water. I woke up this morning and I did my high intensity run. I found a few hills. Where did I get the energy? I hadn't had anything to eat the night before. Where did I get the energy? It's my glycogen stores already in the muscle cell, just waiting to be used. And when I start using the body and my 20 step and eight step pathway starts speeding up, basically it starts saying, fuel. These little molecules of glucose called glycogen just get plucked, fed down the pathway, plucked, fed down the pathway. It's an amazing design. But on a high carbohydrate diet, we've still got glucose left over. So the third place that the body stores the glucose is as fat. Let's do our fat cell. Here it is over here. And on this high carbohydrate diet, many Australians, many Americans, many in the Western countries are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so what do many people do to try and stop getting fat? Try to lose weight, they stop the fat. Fat doesn't make you fat. What makes you fat is this high carbohydrate diet releasing the glucose, forcing the liver to store it as fat. And that's what fat is, excess fuel. Excess fuel that hasn't been able to be used by the body. And you put also into the equation people eating breakfast like a pauper, lunch like a pauper, and the king and the queen together. All they're doing is going to sleep, and then that forces the liver to store all that excess again as fat. Now, understanding this principle is pivotal in understanding diabetes. You see, when sugar goes in, blood glucose levels rise. Very quickly, the brain says, quick, we need a high amount of insulin because those blood, the, the blood glucose levels are too high. So we've got to get the glucose out of the blood, into the cell or storage as glycogen, any more around than it's stored as fat. And so the insulin's released and the blood glucose levels go down. But high glucose demands high insulin. Now we've got another problem. Now blood glucose levels are going too low. Brain says, oh no, we're running out of fuel. Quick, stop the insulin and release the glucagon. Glucagon is the hormone designed to get the blood glucose levels up. Blood glucose levels up. Insulin's designed to get the blood sugar levels down. So the pancreas releases these two hormones and these two hormones are designed to balance the blood glucose or the blood sugar levels. So after the effect of insulin taking it down and glucagon being released, what's also happening is when a person's down there, what do they usually do? Oh dear, I need something. Quick, give me a lolly. You call it candy, we call it lolly. Uh, give me a Mars bar, give me a, a Coke, a, a um, coffee with two teaspoons of sugar. Will that get it up? Oh yes. Boom! Now we're going too high. Body says, oh no, we're too high. Stop the glucagon, release the insulin. Boom! Oh no, we're too low. Can you see what's happening? Crisis, 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 crisis. Now something happens. The cell is actually starting to say, I'm sick of the sight of you. And so it develops insulin resistance. Insulin resistance develops. 
blood glucose levels stay high and the brain says, more insulin, more insulin. Because whenever the blood glucose levels are high, the brain says, we must need more insulin. So what starts to happen now is we've got all this insulin and all this glucose going through. The only thing the body can do with that now is to release it out the urine. Diabetes mellitus means sweet urine. All, all that excess sugar is coming out via the urine. And what's happening in the pancreas, the pancreas basically, it says, I've had enough. I've just had enough. And it stops. That's diabetes. Diabetes is not mentioned in Hippocrates' writings because sugar was not refined. People weren't using it the way they are using it today. But Americans and Australians, they've been consuming high amounts of glucose for a long time, high amounts of sugar. Something else has come into the equation. And it's wheat. You see, have a look at this carbohydrate list. How many are wheat? So wheat, 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 wheat. The majority of the food that Australian, American, Western people are eating is from the wheat family. And in the 1950s, wheat was hybridised. You see, there was a starvation crisis in Africa, in India, in Mexico. And so Dr Norman Borlag and his team of scientists, he put the wheat through intensive crossbreeding. And eventually they produced a plant that had a very high yield, but they had to make it short, otherwise the stalk would just break. So now the wheat only grows this high, it's got a very thick stem and it has a very high yield. We had a farmer do our program, he said, my brother is a wheat farmer. He loves this hybridised wheat because he gets 10 times more grain per acre. What's that? 10 times more money per acre? Can you see why it is so popular? So 1970s, this wheat went worldwide. By the 1990s, every cereal, bread, pretzel, cake, donut, cookie, biscuit, pasta, pie, pizza is made out of the hybridised wheat. So when a person says, yes, but my, my wheat's organically grown. It's non-GMO. I said, it's still a hybridised wheat. <laughs> the only wheat you can buy now that is not hybridised is the original wheat, which is Enkhorn. Also Spelt and Kamut, they are both wild hybrids from the original um, Enkhorn wheat. Another strain is Emma. They're often called ancient grains. They're called ancient grains because they haven't gone through the hybridisation process. But what was never addressed was the effect of this hybridised wheat on the human body. Now in a previous lecture I showed you how it changed the gluten or the protein structure. What I'd like to look at now is how it has changed the starch structure. So the starch in the hybridized wheat, we'll call it a hybridized wheat, is called amylopectin A. And amylopectin A, the starch in the hybridized wheat, it gets the blood glucose glucose levels up very quick and very fast, even faster than sugar, as I'll show you in a minute. So blood glucose levels go up very high, very fast, and then we get this corresponding dump. Now to give you a comparison, in bananas and potatoes, so bananas and potatoes, the starch in those foods is called amylopectin B. And amylopectin B, if you're familiar with glycemic index, it gets the blood glucose levels up fairly high. In fact, most diabetics are told, keep away from bananas and potatoes, because they do, but not as high as amylopectin A. So amylopectin B, basically it's like this. So it's not as high, not as fast, but it's still reasonably high. In legumes, so legumes are lentils, chickpeas, lima beans, black-eyed beans. It contains the starch amylopectin C. And amylopectin C has a nice steady rise 
and a nice steady drop. And that's exactly what every cell in the body wants, a nice, steady, sure delivery of fuel. So basically, it's like this. That's what our cells want. So this amylopectin A, which was produced in the hybridization process, it's quite a dangerous starch because it gets the blood sugar level up very high, very fast. Now understanding this, you will now understand what I'm about to tell you on the glycemic index. So the glycemic index is how quickly glucose in a food is released into the blood. So glycemic index baseline is 55. Let me give you something to compare. Cherries, in fact most berries are around 26. Grapefruit, grapefruit is 25. So for someone who has diabetes, this is good fruit because it gives a nice slow delivery of glucose. Diabetics are told, go for your low glycemic foods because they give a nice slow delivery. I think 50 is sweet potato. So that's why most diabetics are told to eat sweet potato instead of potato. Potato gets it up fairly high. So sugar, whether it be white or whether it be tan or whether it be brown or whether it be black, is 59 on the glycemic index chart. Now, we're not surprised at that. But your refined wheat, so this will be white bread, white cereal, white cakes, all your refined wheat, it has a glycemic index of 69. Now, have a look at that. Because of the amylopectin A in the wheat, it gets the blood sugar level up higher than sugar. The next piece of information is shocking. Whole meal. So whole meal, whole meal wheat has a glycemic index of 72. How could whole meal wheat, whether it be bread or cereals or pastas, how come it gets the blood, the blood sugar level up higher than even the refined? It's because of the amylopectin A. Because the whole meal is not refined, it has more amylopectin A in it than the refined. Now, I was presenting this at our health retreat one day and a lady began to cry. I said, why are you crying? She said, I'm a diabetic. She said, I'm 65. I was diagnosed two years ago. She said, I do everything they tell me. I have wholemeal cereal, wholemeal bread, wholemeal pasta, wholemeal pies. And she said, and every six months I go to the doctor and he puts me on more insulin. She said, I'm, I'm crying tears of frustration because I do everything they tell me and I'm getting worse. And what's the definition of insanity, by the way? to do what you've always done and expect different results. She said, I'm, I'm crying tears of joy because you have just solved the puzzle. This explains the diabetic, not epidemic we're seeing, pandemic. There's hardly a home in the Western countries that doesn't have a diabetic in it. We, sugar doesn't let get off the hook. <laughs> sugar certainly gets the blood sugar rises and dumps. But most people don't realise that the hybridised wheat is one of the biggest contributing factors to this diabetic pandemic that we're seeing. Now, if you'd like to check this out a little bit more, in the book Wheat Belly by Dr William Davis, he explains it very well and in detail. I mentioned a book called Serial Killer by Alan Watson. And remember what I said that he, he told in the book? 93% of American children have cereal for breakfast. 30% of the cereals are sugar. What's the other percentage? In the majority of cases, it is wheat. That's a toxic cocktail for diabetes. A toxic cocktail for the poor pancreas. One in three American children by the age of three are overweight or obese. Can you see why? 
In the book Wheat Belly, Dr. William Davis, he shows that because it gets the blood sugar level up so high, so fast, it demands that that be dealt with very quickly and the body stores it in a form of visceral fat, mostly on the internal organs, causing the, the belly <laughs> to protrude out, but also on the belly. In fact, in his book, just about every page is the term wheat belly. Now, this doctor has decades of clinical practice up his sleeve, and that's why he wrote his book, because he saw again and again and again. And it's often the missing link in conquering diabetes and also conquering weight. So, food. What is the best food for a diabetic? Vegetables. Vegetables are high in fiber. Vegetables are high in minerals, your, your healers, and vegetables are low in sugars. That's very important for the diabetic. I met a man a year ago who told me that he had diabetes. He went to a health retreat and they said, you can conquer your diabetes by eating legumes. He said, so I did. He said, every meal I have lentils or chickpeas or lima beans or black eyed beans, and, I, and so I met him a year ago, and I think he started that five years ago. He has no, no diabetes now. So the best protein is your legumes. Just remember to soak them. Just remember to rinse them well. Just remember to three quarters cook them, rinse them well, and then you can put them in their sauce. And they can have another half, one hour in their sauce. Another excellent form of protein is nuts. Nuts are so delicious, there's only one problem. There is a tendency to overdo it. So try and have eight to 10 nuts per meal. The only nut I don't advise is actually not a nut, it's a legume, and that is the peanut because they are commonly infected with mold. And seeds, excellent form of protein. So there's your sunflower, your Pumpkin seeds, very easy to include that in a lunchbox. Also your ground flax seed and your chia seeds. And your grains, for your grains, they are also a form of protein. The best grains are millet and oats. If someone is celiac, they're best to keep away from the oats. And if you like oats, just don't have them every day. Maybe have them twice a week. Quinoa, another excellent grain, and buckwheat. And for your breads, ideally you would go for your inkhorn if you can get it. Your inkhorn original wheat, spelt, and kamut. It is gluten that makes bread nice and elastic, but it is the gluten structure that has been changed and complicated really in the hybridized wheat. So these ones have a simple, less complex protein structure. And it's not, the gluten actually doesn't develop until the water goes on the protein and that's when the gluten strands start coming out. So that's the best food. And I have seen many people conquer their diabetes by targeting this. The last one is your fats. And the best fats are your nuts, your seeds, your avocados. And the two best fats to be eaten freely. And when I say freely, and I, I don't know anyone that can drink a cup of oil. So when I say freely, I'm thinking, I'm really referring to the, to the oils, the, the, the pure oils. So that's your coconut. They are concentrated and so they should not be overdone. But you know, a teaspoon or two at a meal, that's a nice amount. So, th so there are your oils. So they're, they're your best fats. Now that's the food program that will help to conquer diabetes. So number two, very important to keep well hydrated. So hydration. Your pancreas cannot create those hormones unless you supply the water. Most of our hormones are largely created with water. 
So that's eight glasses a day, at least more if you perspire a lot. And with those glasses, the little bit of Celtic salt. Number three, exercise. Exercise has a dramatic effect on diabetes. What exercise does that it is increases the blood to the cell. And because the eight step pathway and the 20 step pathway are both speeding up, the cells actually needing more fuel. So it develops extra insulin receptor sites. So eating this food Drinking enough water and implementing an exercise program will turn diabetes around. It can turn insulin resistance around in a matter of about a week. That's quite exciting, isn't it? The human body's been designed to heal itself. And once it's given the right conditions, it responds very, very quickly. The best exercise, and I've mentioned this a few times, is high intensity interval training. It's that high intensity that produces a dramatic change in the way the cell works. Basically, you're putting huge demands on the body, so it's screaming out for more glucose, screaming out for more insulin, rather than a sedentary person eating huge amounts of carbohydrates where the cell basically says, I'm sick of the sight of you. I don't want to see you anymore. Insulin resistance. And that can be turned around very, very quickly from I'm sick of the sight of you to I need more. But not only that, when you do this high intensity exercise, it increases the circulation of the blood to the pancreas. And when the circulation of the blood is increased to the pancreas, the pancreas revives. One young man said, the doctor said my pancreas is dead. I said, is it gangrene? What's dead? I said, if there's blood going through that pancreas, it is alive. His name's Dan. He's 50. Well, he was 20 when he came to us, but at 15, he had a strong course of antibiotics which had damaged his pancreas. It had damaged the beta cells in his pancreas that produce insulin. And he was told his pancreas was dead. He came to us and he had this diet. Now, fruits are okay for a diabetic as long as they're low GI. But Dan, he said to me, nope, until I conquer this, I'm not going to eat any fruit. He looked at the grapes on the table and he said, nope, grapes are actually very high glycemic index. Now, the first week, he was with us for four weeks. He did two weeks of program, two weeks in the garden. He didn't tell me this till later. But in the middle of the night, if he had a drop in his blood glucose levels, he would take a, a lolly, or you call it a candy. That would get his blood glucose levels up very quick, very fast. It always gave him a headache. Second week, he decided to stop the lolly and try an apple. It takes a long time to eat an apple in the middle of the night. And that would get his blood glucose levels up. On the third week, he did something else. He, if his blood glucose levels were going too low, and by the way, why would they be going too low? He's on too much insulin. You see, he doesn't have to be on that high amount of insulin anymore because the food he's taking is not screaming at the pancreas. It's actually giving it a break. So on the third week, if he got a blood sugar ever low in the middle of the night, he would get up and do 30 push-ups. He'd get on the floor and he'd do 30 push-ups and his blood glucose levels came back to normal. Where did that come from? When he started moving the body, his cells were, were demanding more glucose, so it started plucking his glycogen stores. And as those little molecules of glucose are plucked and fed through here, it raised his blood glucose levels. He told me that he got up one morning and his blood glucose levels were three. Now in Australia, um, our readings would be between uh, five, six, seven, that, that would be normal. Well, his were three, that's nearly pass out. So he had a big drink of water, he had some salt, a big drink of water, 
went to the bathroom, had another drink of water, put his joggers on and went for some high intensity. At Misty Mountain, we've got hills. So running up the hills, walking down the hills, running up the hills. He came back and he tested his blood glucose levels and they were nine. They'd gone from three to nine and he'd eaten nothing. It was his glycogen stores. After the third week, when he started to experience that, he came to me and he said, why didn't anyone tell me about glycogen stores? <laughs> it, I think it's the diabetic's best kept secret is the glycogen stores already in the muscle cell. When they're in the, mus in the muscle cell, it's like they're in a prison. They can only be used by the muscle cell. Your liver can store glycogen too, and that glycogen can be sent all over the body. He was a very excited young man. By the end of uh, three and a half weeks, he dropped his insulin intake by 90%. That's impressive, isn't it? For him to be able to do that, what does that mean? It means his pancreas isn't dead at all. It means his pancreas is starting to work. At a health retreat in America, oh, it was probably a year ago this happened, we had a guy do our program and he was 62. He came in with lymphedema. He actually came in in a wheelchair. And when I was investigating why he had lymphedema, the doctors had taken out the lymphatic nodes in the top of his leg, wondering if that would help his pancreas. I don't quite understand that, but that's what had happened. He said to me, I've spent over a million dollars in the last 10 years trying to get my health back on track. He was on 80 units of insulin a day, long and short acting, morning and night. He was on blood pressure medication. He was on cholesterol lowering medication. He was on blood thinning medication. He went through our detox program. We actually decided to get rid of these bandages that, were, that he'd spent a fortune on for his, uh, for his legs. We started massaging his legs. We got him on the little lymphocyzer, you know, like the little trampoline, just jogging away. That gets the lymphatic fluid moving very nicely. We had him on some herbs. He had to be careful not to walk too much because of the weight down on his legs. So he was with us for two weeks. By the end of those two weeks, he was on 10 units of insulin a day. So he'd gone from 80 units of insulin to 10 units of insulin a day. He was off most of his medication. He said to me, I am on no insulin. He was told he would never be off the insulin. He said to me, I've lost 95 pounds, 95 pounds in two and a half months. He said to me, he said, whatever you say, I will do. He used to sit next to me at the table when we ate and he'd say, have I got the, have I got the right food? Am I doing it right? And I'd have a look and I'd say, yeah, good amount of salad. Yeah, uh, give me one of your potatoes. <laughs> Don't have two potatoes, just have one. So, so we'd, we'd look at that. And for breakfast, he'd only have the low GI fruits, which are all your berries, your strawberries, your cherries. He was focused. Now, this man is in his mid-60s. He said to me, in the email where he told me he's off all his insulin, he's off all his medication, he's, he's lost 95 pounds in weight, and his aim was but by Christmas, so that's only a month away, I think he's aiming to have lost 110 pounds. He said, and I cycle six miles a day. You see, there is a formula, and if you abide by the formula, it works. Don't believe it when you're told your pancreas doesn't work. I never say never. And there's a beautiful verse in the Bible. It's easy to remember. It's Ezekiel 36, 36. It says that the heathen that the left roundabout might know that I, the Lord God, build the ruined places. That's ruined pancreases. <laughs> that I, the Lord God, build the ruined places and plant again that which was desolate. For I, the Lord God, hath spoken it and I will do it. Lovely promise to claim when you're looking at reviving an organ or any part of your body. And in Psalm 119, these verses, I think, apply very much to this man. In verse 62, sorry, 69 it is. 
of, of Psalm 119. Verse 69, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. And in, and in the same psalm, but down to, I think it's verse uh, 70, it says, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes or thy laws that govern the body. You see, this man, if he hadn't got that sick, he would never have learnt these ways. So what I say is don't wait till you get sick. Start giving your body the right conditions now so that you need never get to that. And then when we come up to verse 73, Psalm 119 states, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I might learn thy commandments. Learn thy laws, the laws that govern the functioning of the human body. So to conquer diabetes, pure air. <laughs> we must have lots of pure air. Check your pillows, check your quilts, check the carpet in your room, check that you can have open windows every night. Make sure the air that you're breathing while you're sleeping is the freshest of air. Sunshine, allow sun to go on the pancreas every day. Well, we're in Vancouver. There's not a lot of sun. I saw a little bit today. As soon as you see it, run out, lift your top up. Remember, under your left rib is your pancreas. The sun penetrates very, very deep. Temperance, not taking anything into the body that will harm it and taking in moderation the good things. Number four, no. Some things must be eliminated. No caffeine. Caffeine causes an insulin response. So caffeine puts a load on the pancreas. How does caffeine cause an insulin response? Well, caffeine, when it goes into the body, creates a, it's like a crisis or a stress response. That's why people say, oh, I love my coffee, gets me up and going. I say, yeah, that's because you've, got a, you've had a crisis. Of course you'll be up and going if there's a crisis. So caffeine must stop because it causes an insulin response. The other thing that must stop is sugar. All refined sugar must stop. Now for a diabetic, even honey and maple syrup should be kept away from until the pancreas starts working. Once the pancreas starts working, you may be able to have a little bit of maple syrup, maybe a little honey, but definitely no sugar. It's one of the causes. Also, no wheat. And I'm referring particularly to the hybridized wheat. So I'll say an HY here. Also, definitely no alcohol and definitely no tobacco. These are the main things that should stop when a person has diabetes. There are some things that should not enter if you're looking for optimum performance. So let's now go to law number four, which is point number five, which is rest. It's between the hours of 9 p.m. and 2 a.m that the pancreas specifically we're referring to in this lecture revives, recharges, allow it to heal by making sure you're sleeping in those hours. Number six point is exercise and we've got exercise here. And the sixth point is proper diet, which is the food. And the seventh point is use of water. And we've got water there. And the eighth law, which will make our second, our sixth point, is trust in divine power. Claiming, and I'll write it here, claiming Ezekiel 36, 36, that the heathen that are left round about might know that I, the Lord God, build the ruined places and plant again that which was desolate. For I, the Lord God, hath spoken it and I will do it. One more point, and we'll make this point seven with food, always low glycemic index foods. This can make a dramatic difference in maintaining blood glucose levels is going for your low glycemic index foods. And you can easily download that um, off the web. 
or most nutritionists will give you a low glycemic chart. It's not hard to get it. But I've actually given you a little bit of a brief preview. All your berries, strawberries, blackberries, blueberries, cherries, boysenberries, they're all low GI foods and also grapefruit. So they're all your low GI fruits and probably with your vegetables, the only one that you have to be a little bit cautious of is the white potato. Some say, what about your carrots? Well, you would have to eat truckloads of carrots to actually get the glycemic index up very, very high. At our health retreat, the first two days, our guests always juice. So mostly our juices are carrot, celery and apple juices and their blood glucose levels are always coming down. So these are the basic points to conquer diabetes and I've seen many people conquer their diabetes by doing that. It's quite simple, but just remember, God made the human body with the ability to heal itself. Thank you.